Hallelujah. It is certainly an honor and a privilege to stand before you. You may be seated even in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. We certainly honor your pastor and my friend and celebrate his 34 years of pastoral ministry. Come on, help me celebrate Dr. Melvin Mariner. Hallelujah. And his first family and his first lady. Hallelujah. You, you do realize that longevity in ministry matters particularly when it leaves legacy. You ought to thank God that you have a faithful pastor. Uh, and so it's indeed with great humility that we give honor to God on this day. Uh, we bring you greetings from the Providence United Church of Christ in Chesapeake where we serve as the senior shepherd uh, and to all of you, we extend Jesus' joy and the love of God. I want to call your attention to John's gospel. I want you to find it and rest on your feet. In the old church, they would say, when you have it, say amen. Amen. And if you don't have it, say, wait on me. John's gospel, John chapter 11. Again, it is good to be with you all. I want to raise for your consideration, one singular solitary text. I want you to look at verse 11. After saying these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to wake him up. Spirit of the Lord, would you fall fresh upon me? Consecrate me now to the sacredness of this moment and into thy service by the power of grace divine. Would you let my soul look up with a steadfast hope and my will be lost in thine for your glory and for our good. Let the church say amen. 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 Again, Grove Church, it's so good to be with you and all of God's children to this aggregation of clergy, to this fine musical quadre. It is good to be here and to the executive of the year, Sister Cheryl Jones, so grateful to God for all that she does to make things happen. Amen. Amen. I'm on the understanding that you are beginning the month of pursuing commitment. And this morning, I want, to rest, want you to wrestle with me from this thought, maintaining commitment in the face of crises. I'm going to need some preaching help this morning as I am fresh off of two wheels. So why don't you turn to somebody and say, maintain commitment in the face of crises. Mm. Distraught from the sickness of their brother, filled with more questions than answers, 
without relief, disappointed, no doubt, with the untimely and unfortunate circumstances that life brings, Mary and Martha send word to Jesus that their brother is sick. Without hesitation, it appears, these sisters, known for their relationship with the Lord, did the only thing they knew to do when life got out of control. They called on the Lord. I want you to hear their prayer and their plea. Lord, the one you love is sick. Can you see the hope that filled their message? The confidence that followed their complaint? Surely, if he will show up for anyone, he will show up for the one he loves. These sisters, sisters who served Jesus spiritually and physically, got close to Jesus in discipleship. These sisters whose faith was on display and lives connected to Jesus. These sisters whose commitment to serve was without question and they sat at the feet of Jesus now stand in the gallows of anticipation. They're hoping the Lord would show up. Have you ever been there? Wondering, waiting, wishing that the Lord who loves you would base his love on showing up for you. A word a whisper, a song, a statement, a directive, a doorbell, something that represents an answer from the Lord. Because after all, this is the one he loves. They were hoping that Jesus, where he was, would speak a word of healing, issue a command to stop the bleeding, turn mud into medicine and put it on somebody's eye. They send a message, he reads the message, it shows up in the text thread that he's seen the message, he reads it again, and rather than acknowledge the message with a thumbs up, a praying hands, a heart emoji, Jesus doesn't respond. As a matter of fact, he looks at the text message, puts the phone down, goes back to doing what he was doing, and says to his boys, this sickness will not end in death. <laughs> Here's what he says, Grove. It's for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. And the text says he stayed there, y'all, two more days. All of us have lived in between the tension of waiting on the Lord, haven't we? And all of us are familiar with the emotions present in waiting and hoping, aren't we? Because all of us have wrestled with timely or untimely news regarding loved ones and have struggled, like these sisters, to make sense of it. We brace ourselves with all the silver lining questions. We'll fake it till we... Fake it. 
because we look for some type of relief. And I know I'm not by myself about waiting on God to deliver me from a bad situation because I know that he loves me. But what do you do, church, when the Lord doesn't show up? Go ahead, I'll wait. What do you do when he doesn't show up to pull you out of the mess that you got yourself in? What do you do when he tells you that you just have to grin and bear it, suck it up, don't buck under pressure because my grace is sufficient for you. What do you do when you know that he loves you and he still hasn't made his way to your address? This scene suggests to me, y'all, that there will be times in our lives where we will be faced with perplexing situations, faith-filled moments, grief-stricken realities, unanswered questions, and questions about tomorrow. There will be moments when our commitment to God will be challenged in the face of crises. And our response cannot be one of flight or fear, but of faithfulness and commitment. Let me tell you why I offer this critique. Because in this season, evil is attempting to co-op all that is godly. The politics and politics that seemingly invade our spaces, these pandemic streets and these eschatological or last day realities upon us, you and I cannot afford to subscribe to this juvenile, immature faith in Jesus or adopt this sophomoric theology that if he doesn't show up when I want him to, show up on my timetable, if he doesn't work like I want it to work, if he doesn't do it like I want him to do it, if he doesn't make it happen the way I want it to happen, then somehow he ain't working and he's not concerned, he doesn't care, and he doesn't love me. Well, the devil is a liar. You and I got to steal remain committed and we got to remain faithful and despite the vicissitudes of life we got to stay locked in because the Lord is coming I want to be clear this morning that you and I exist for God's glory and there are going to be times in our pursuit of God when God will extract glory from your life. Here it is, and don't miss this. Sometimes you're going through, saints, only because you're going through. That's your shout right there. Sometimes you're passing through it. You're trailblazing it. And God is using your impossible situation to show other people that all things are possible to them that believe. Come on, don't make me preach by myself. Do I have any people in here who can testify that my situation looked like it was impossible, but the God I serve. The text says, grow, that this sickness isn't unto death, but for glory to be extracted. I don't know who I'm talking to this morning, but somebody is in the middle of a bad situation. And guess what you're wondering? If God's going to come through for you, and he's saying, are you going to let me come through for you? Are you going to let me extract glory from your life? Are you going to let me show this? This 
season that you're in isn't for your demise. It's for your deliverance. It's not for your punishment. It's for your purpose. It's not cause you, it's not to cause you pain, but to develop you for your promotion. I ain't saying nothing yet to make you want to shout. It's for your purpose. It's not to cause you trauma, but to bring you triumph. It's not to discipline you, but to put you towards your destiny. And while it might be full of tears, late night prayers, worship in the stall at work, it's for your good and for his glory. I wish I had some company who would say to me, God, I exist for your glory. Proverbs writer was right. Commit to the Lord whatever you do and he will establish your plans. Here it is. Delayed is not denied. And sometimes we have to wrestle in the delay. Now I still believe Grove that the Lord works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. You and I just have to trust his working because his working works it out. Come on, holler back at your boy and testify if you can testify that the Lord worked it out for you while you were sleeping. He worked it out for you when you didn't have a dog in the fight. He worked it out for you. As a matter of fact, he made a way when there wasn't a way. He opened the door when there wasn't a door. He worked it out for my good. My, my, my. I feel like preaching in here. You know, if we're all honest, we all wrestle with delay. All of us want God to answer when we pray, answer when we call, respond when we cry. All of us want God's level of power to meet us in our plea for help, in our cry of distress, in our moment of need. But what do you do, church, when he says, I ain't coming? Never mind that pie in the sky theology. I know your pastor and I know he doesn't preach that. But sometimes this faith journey consists of wrestling in God's delay. Listen, let me tell you, here's where we have to be cautious and not move before the Lord tells us to move. Just because you don't see him working doesn't mean he ain't working. Just because he doesn't come when you call doesn't mean he ain't coming. Just because he doesn't answer doesn't mean he ain't answering. And just because he doesn't work like you think he should work doesn't mean he isn't working. You and I have to be careful that in moments of crises, we don't disqualify ourselves from our deliverance. Subscribing to this wishy-washy commitment level wrapped in this fragmented Burger King theology of having it my way. Do I have any company here? Job was right. Can we only accept good 
from the hand of God and not adversity also. Beloved, there are going to be moments where your commitment to Christ is going to be challenged. But here it is. There are also going to be moments when it's going to be rewarded. And anybody who has lived long enough knows God's timing is distinctly different than ours. And it's not because he needs time to figure it out, Cheryl. Time rests in him. Therefore, for God, time is not of the essence. But for us, trust in his timing is. How we wrestle in the in-between time is a matter of trust and leaning on God. And here's my point. It's easy to trust God when everything is going well. It's easy to trust God when you got more money than month. It's easy to trust God when every bill is paid and you got some extra zeros in the bank account. It's easy to trust God when your kids are living the way you raise them despite your own toxicity. It's easy to trust God when you're the cat's meow and the corn I can peel. But what do you do when the Lord doesn't show up and work for you the way you believe he's supposed to work? The problem that we have, y'all, is trusting God from glory to glory. But here it is. If you are able to trust him in the past glory, you can trust him in the in-between glory, and then you can watch him bring you to a new glory. Come on, tell somebody, the book ain't closed. The chapter is, he's still writing it and making it up for me. So here's my follow-up question for you. Can you trust God? Can you be committed to God while sitting in the incubator of your issue? Can you trust him? while taking up residence in the midst of your trauma? Can you trust him while being housed in a hopeless and hapless job, a hopeless and hapless marriage, a hopeless and hapless situation? Can you trust him in a tomb while being garrisoned in your grave clothes? Can you trust him while he is working it out? Can you trust him while he is quiet and hasn't spoken a word to your situation? Can you still show up on Sunday with your Sunday best on? Can you still raise your hands in worship? Can you still open up your mouth? Can you still back down the devil even though God hasn't showed up for you? Can you still show up at work on a Monday and smiling and saying, this is the day that the Lord has made and I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. Can you still show up on Wednesday and declare that no weapon formed against me shall be able to prosper? Can you show up on Friday and say, don't thank God it's Friday. I thank God that I'm forgiven. Can you still bless the high and holy name of the Lord even in the midst of your issue? I agree with that Prince of Preachers Charles Spurgeon, we have to trust God's heart when we cannot trace God's hands. Here it is. Lazarus was dead to Mary and Martha. He was dead to them, but he wasn't dead to him because Jesus says to the disciples, let us get up from here. We got some business. We got to go. I'm sorry. I'm at the Grove. I should have said that with the proper English and the decorum of the doctor, but let me go a little bit. He said, we got some business 
business that we got to go take care of. We got to go raise Lazarus. Our boy is sick and I got to go wake him up. Mary says, <laughs> once Jesus arrives, she says to him, you see it right there in the passage of scripture, she says to him, Lord, if you had been here, she says to him, if you would have been here, she said, I know your power. I've seen you do miracles. I've watched you heal other people. I've watched you deliver other folk. I've watched you walk on water. If you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. I can see Jesus standing there. And he says, he's only asleep. I'm sorry, y'all. Just give me a minute. She says, Lord, I know he's asleep. And I know he'll rise in the resurrection. Sometimes the Lord has to correct our theology because we've been believing a lie for too long. There, there's something in this passage, y'all. Mary's expectation was removed. Listen to what she said. I'm going to run it back for you and I'm going to get out of here. She said, if you had been here, she relegated his power to his presence. She said, the only way you could have worked this out was had you been here. Can I just stick a pin right here? Has anybody ever got to work from a bad boss in a bad situation and the boss will come in your office and say, I thought about things last night and I was wrong. Anybody have a situation like that? Went to the doctor and the doctor said, the scan shows cancer uh, in the first degree. And then he calls you back in and says, when I looked at your biopsy when I called you, I seen a legion of cancer. But I went back and I looked again and I didn't see it. I need some sanctified folk who understand that God doesn't have to be present to allow his power to be present in our lives. Do I have any help in this house? Come on, y'all gonna help me close this thing. She says to her, your brother will rise. Come on, I need you to help me tell somebody, don't lose your expectation. Watch this. Too many of us get in dead situations, dead places, and our expectation of the Lord goes away. We lose our faith-filled guarantee. We succumb to the predicament. We come into this house and we lift up holy hands and we extol and exalt the name of God. And for at least two and a half hours on Sunday, we are saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues, rebuking demons, and proclaiming the mysteries of God. For at least two and a half hours, we know what it feels like to serve an awesome and mighty God. But as soon as dead things happen, we begin to 
to talk to God like he is normal. Talk to him like he is a friend and say things like, if you had been here, you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. God, if you would have been here, I wouldn't have been sick like that. If you would have showed up when I called you, I wouldn't have had to go through what I went through. And I want to be clear today, I am not denying that bad times happen. I'm not giving you some opiate and telling you that misery moments don't occur and that the weight of life shows up. But just like the weight of life shows up, the weight of our faith shows up too. And you and I got to give it the opportunity to lead us out of the graveyard of life so that we can wake up and stand up and be present for what he does. Cause after all, he specializes in raising dead things. Tell somebody, don't throw away your expectation. Hmm. Do I have a few people at least who can testify, I once was blind, but now I see. Once dead, but now I'm alive. Guess what, y'all? Don't you dare diminish the power of God from working on things that are dead just because you can't see them as being alive. He still raises dead things. I'm, I'm, I'm finished, I gotta get out of here. I've kept you long enough. I don't want your pastor to be upset with me. But years ago, the executive director of Alcoholics Anonymous was interviewed regarding the success of the program. The reporter asked him, what would the director ascribe the success of his program to? And he began to run down a litany of things. He said to the director, is it the consistency of monthly meetings? And sometimes weekly where people show up to be in community with one another. And the director said, no. The interviewer said, was it the, pre the presence of individual sponsors for those who are fresh addicts and need someone to hold on to when they feel the urge. The director said, no. The interviewer pushed it because he's probing. He wants to know why Alcoholic Anonymous has the highest rate of non-recidivism than any other program in the country. And the director was getting upset. The interviewer said, was it the confessional statement that addicts make when they stand up in the meeting? Hi, my name is Avery and I am an addict. And everybody in the room says, I'm almost done. But the director said, no. The director said to the interviewer, all of the things you mentioned, they help. But they are outcomes of a current reality. Befuddled, the interviewer looked at him as one who had never been addicted to anything. He didn't understand what the director was getting at. And the director said to him, Cheryl, he said, our ministry is successful because people come in 
expecting resurrection. He said, they come in expecting to live again. They come in expecting dead, drug-addicted lives to be reclaimed, restored, and resurrected. He said, Mr. Interviewer, they come in expecting life. This is precisely what Jesus is showing us in the text. He assures Mary and us that he still gives life. And he says, our friend Lazarus is asleep, but I'm going to wake him up. Here's the rub and we gone. I wonder how many of us this morning come into this place expecting resurrection? How many of us come in here expecting life? How many of us come in here expecting to live again? and to live again and to live again. How many of us expect him to move mountains and open doors and make ways out of no ways? How many of us expect him to give water and dry land and bring forth fruit from withered trees? Well, I came to tell you this morning he still raises dead things. He still resurrects dead lives. He still resurrects dead situations. He still resurrects resurrects dead marriages and dead ministries and dead relationships and dead dreams and dead communities and dead hopes and dead homes and dead people. He still raises the dead. Come on, you got to help me close. Tell somebody, don't give away your expectation. Don't let stuff rob you of this power. Don't let circumstances defy your commitment. Don't let disappointment dislodge your expectation. Don't let the struggles of this life snatch your expectations. He still raises dead things. Is there anybody who can testify that I once was lost, but now I'm, wait a minute, that's not the one I want. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Amazing grace shall always be my song of praise. And if he raised me before, he can raise me again. Woo. Woo. I like how the chord goes. It says, for it was grace that brought my liberty and I'll never know just why he came to love me so. He looked beyond my faults and he saw my needs and I shall forever lift my eyes to Calvary. Do me a favor, turn to somebody and tell them he still raises dead things. You didn't say it like you mean it. You didn't say it like you mean it. Turn to another neighbor and tell him he still raises dead things. You didn't believe it. You still sitting down. Some of y'all ain't said nothing yet. Go to turn to yourself and say he still raises dead things. And because he does, because you know that you once was dead, but now you're alive because of any person being Christ Jesus. They are a new creature. The old is dead and the new is here. Honey, here I am. I'm walking in my destiny. I'm walking in his favor because he still raises dead things.